<laughs> this is Unreal Engine 4. This is a uh, tech demo we put together in conjunction with Epic Games called Strategy VR. It's actually interesting in that it's a third person game stuck in a first person world. A lot of uh, the assumptions we had about VR was that it would only be really functional for a first person, and so we didn't e we couldn't even imagine what third person would look, would look like in VR. So what we've got here is a tower defense game, and uh, if you look down, there's like little goblins. If you want to lean forward, you can see uh, get a closer look at them. Yep, and you can get a different perspective. So lean to the side and follow this guy around to the side. You can really get a better uh, better perspective on the map. But at the same time, if you want to get an overall view, just lean back. So it's kind of like a fog of war but a little bit more natural. It's not like uh, some artificial grayed out area. It really is, I want to focus on the right side of the battlefield. Okay, I'm gonna lean in, and then if I want to actually get a better vantage point, make sure no one's sneaking up or trying to set up an ambush behind something that's hidden, then I can lean around and peer and get a better look at it. So just, just so I could explain this a little bit as to what I'm seeing, uh, I'm seeing a full image, it's a third person game, but it's, it's like you're right there, and you know, if if you were to compare to the original uh, developers kit, this is a lot more visual flexibility. Like when I'm looking through, it's not just my neck movement; it's actually my whole body movement is 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 uh, playing a part in the game. And uh, it's really very you know very interesting experience. And I'm you know I I I don't feel nauseous or any any discomfort. I mean, obviously this game. You know, obviously, they put some VR thought into this for sure. Was this customized? Yes. So when I say customized, I don't mean just for the Oculus, but you know, is this a custom game for VR or is it intended? It's, it's just a tech demo. It's something that the uh, Epic guys put together in a few weeks. Uh, we told them, hey, you know what, we need something to show off at CES. And they were like, hey, let's push the limits and see what we can do. Put like a game inside of a game and let's explore game design and really uh, take a crack at, three, uh, at third person. Third-person VR is just, is, it's really uncharted territory, and so uh, we're really excited to have them uh, at least take a stab at this. What do you think? Well, obviously I'm impressed. I mean, this is, uh, you know, this, this is really wonderful stuff. Now, I, I want to underscore, I mean, there's a, you know, there's a debate about, you know, VR drivers versus native support. This is an example where native support, you can only do it through native support. I mean, there's, there's clearly uh, design advantages to native that you cannot do with a VR driver. And this just, you know, this, is, this exemplifies it. Here, do me a favor, I want to show off the positional tracking a little bit and the camera and some of the concerns. Turn around. Yeah, <laughs> I completely forgot about that. You know, I, we're, I'm so used to playing a regular game where you're just looking straight forward. You know, you, you literally, you look over your shoulder and you've got this entire game environment. This is, like, what's right in front of me is really just a small element of the entire game, game universe. So that's where the positional tracking shuts off. You see how it turned gray? Okay. Oh, you're completely wait. behind. You're completely occluded at this point. But you see how quickly it came back? So there's like there's a detection mechanism, so it warns you when you're out of the. the it's just something that they put together. It's a subtle hint. It basically blacks. It goes black and white. It's a desaturation mode, and it really just lets us know the limits of the positional tracking at this current state. But um, I think you'll find that. I mean, what do you think of it? It has pretty good range, right? Well, I, obviously, I'm impressed. I mean, this is. Uh, I mean, this is just a tech demo. I mean, this isn't like a full fledged. Maybe it is. I don't know. Is it a full fledged game yet, or is it just a demo? I mean, there's there's abs there's no real thought towards like. Game, game, bat, like gameplay balance. Like for instance, you can just pretty much destroy all these guys in a couple seconds. But um, it's just a quick tech demo and a game concept. Yeah. This is Neil Schneider for MTBS TV at CES 2014, and we are joined by my good friend Palmer Lucky. Congratulations, Palmer, for on your continued success. Thank you. Now, why don't you 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 tell us? I mean, last time we, we got together at, at CES, you were impressing everyone with the first developer's kit. And, you know, it was low, relatively low resolution, but it was more than enough to convey the benefits of VR and where VR should ultimately go. What can you tell us about this updated, uh, I, and I wouldn't call it a, we'll call it a prototype. It what, a prototype. What, what, what have you upgraded with the prototype? The two largest additions are we've added full positional tracking and low persistence. So low positional tracking allows you to not just track orientation and fake, fake translation in space. It allows you to actually move your body and have that accurately reflected. And low persistence is a combination of display technologies that allows us to eliminate motion blur and get some other good side effects. Okay, so when we're talking about translation, can you elaborate a little bit more as to what you mean by that? So orientation is... is uh, 
orientation is basically where you're looking, the angle at what you're looking. Translation it allows you to move through space. So, you know, or if I can only track orientation, I can only track where my head's looking. But if I did this and kept my head perfectly level, it wouldn't have any idea how to measure that. Because we have full position tracking now, I can lean side to side, forward, back. I can lean into a desk to examine something, and it tracks all of that accurately, exactly at the same scale that it does in real life. Now, there's two aspects to this, I think. Like, you know, when I was trying out Valkyrie, it's Valkyrie, yes? Valkyrie, Valkyrie excuse me. Um, you know, I was able to lean into the panels and see them up close and everything gets scaled according to distance versus before it was like, I, you know, I had a locked head in the middle of the scene and I look around. Them. Exactly. So I, I appreciate the artistic benefits of it. Is there, are there any other benefits for positional tracking? Is it, it does it have an importance, uh, you know, beyond the artistic side? Yes, definitely. I mean, so there's artistic, there's also gameplay mechanics that you can do, like leaning around a corner or matrix style, leaning back and dodging, dodging bullets or something. But the biggest difference it makes is really around the comfort of the simulation, not just for big, obvious motions, but even very small micro movements are reflected in our system. So uh, all these little movements that we make as we adjust our bodies, as we play, as we change positions are now accurately reflected, which means you're much less likely to feel simulator sickness. Now, I think the technology itself, I mean, obviously it's a much sharper display from you know, what I saw in this prototype. Maybe just, you could just confirm the resolution on it. I can't. Okay, you, but you know, yes? <laughs> yes, we do know, but we, we're not talking about the, the we, we can't talk about the exact specifications of the panel. Okay, so let me, let me rephrase the question. I mean, outside this booth, and it's not the same model, okay, so, you know, I, I know for certain at least it's gone like 1080p, at least from what I saw at the Intel booth. And I don't know where you're going to go with this. This is just a prototype, so I imagine you have other revisions in mind. Am I correct? Okay, so, so I could tell the resolutions obviously changed. I mean, it, it's much sharper. I know there's, a, you know there's obviously future prototypes to come, but the tracking has radically changed. It's not just about you know, the positional tracking, but the technology that you're making it work is very different. Can you explain how you're, you're making this upgraded Rift work? So we have retained our inertial measurement system. So we, we still have a gyroscope, accelerometer, magnetometer that are improved over our original developer kit. And we've also added an optical tracking system. And I can't go into all the details, but essentially it uses a um, custom camera that we've developed and along with custom software. To, and it uses the camera to track infrared markers that are positioned around the headset. And by looking at those markers, it's able to figure out exactly where the headset is in 3D space. So you're still maintaining the original, I shouldn't say the original equipment, but you're still having gyros and magnets. We we've just added to it. And it is, it's, it is fusing the data from both together so that it's taking advantage of the strengths and weaknesses of both systems. And when, in the rare event that you do break the position tracking, like you pretty much have to look directly behind you to break it. Um, but when it does break, it doesn't break like it would with a purely optical system, which is very jarring. It just switches back to the less accurate uh, inertial system. Now, one of the big issues that, it, right since the beginning that you've been working to fight is latency. Um, have you introduced some new technologies to, to help reduce that? Yes, the display switches nearly instantaneously, um, and it's running at a higher refresh rate, so the, you, you can push more frames a second through it. Uh, we've gotten, like, so the demos we were showing at, uh, at E3 this year were somewhere between 50 and 60 milliseconds end-to-end -end latency through Unreal Engine 4, and our demos now are somewhere between 30 and 40 milliseconds. So we've cut it about in half, and we have internal demos that go that go under 20 milliseconds, which is our goal for the consumer consumer version, to make it make it possible for any application to achieve that kind of latency. Have you put some thought into the way software interacts with the graphics card to reduce latency as well? Yes. Any ideas? Nothing specifically that I can name, but we're doing a lot of optimization with the graphics pipeline to minimize the latency. Okay. One thing I noticed as well was when we were doing that demo in, in the other room, Normally, when I see an Oculus demo, I see I, you know I see the doubled warped image on the screen, but I didn't see that this time. Is is the is the format changing? Nope, everything is exactly the same. It's just that we've got a um, a scalar box that takes one of the eyes 
and then crops it and dewarps it and pipes it out to a single television. And it's 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 really expensive. It's like professional AV hardware geometry scaler. It's a few thousand dollars, and we're just using it for demos. Okay, excellent, excellent. Now, for game developers, I mean, how many kits are you up to now for developer kit one? Something like a little over 50,000 now. Okay, very nice. Last time it was 40,000, so you know, already this video is out of date, I'm sure. Um, but when it, for, for game developers using the original developer's kit, is their code still going to be applicable to the updated version? There are still things that they're going to need to change, but we're working to make our SDK um, as cross-compatible as we can. So it's pretty, easy to, it's pretty easy to port things over. And in fact, a lot of applications that are built using our latest SDK, which has support for our internal prototypes, we're able to plug in our stuff to applications and use it even if they've never touched or seen uh, our new hardware. Now, um, have, have you discovered new software challenges? And, and when I'm saying software challenges, I should really say artistic challenges, because once you have this positional tracking, there's all this added flexibility that, that games never really had to deal with before. Have you, have you come up with some ideas on, on, on solving those issues, if, if they are indeed there? Yeah, we're putting together a best practices guide. We've been doing a lot of prototyping on what works, what doesn't, and it, there's, there's nothing really there's nothing really too challenging to get around. It just has to be kept in mind. If you don't want a game to rely on position tracking for gameplay and it's just something that allows you know, to move your head to have more realistic tracking, you can do that. Uh, you don't have to change your game fundamentally to take advantage of it. Um, but I think there are going to be some games where some of the gameplay elements do rely on position tracking. Now, uh, you know, I'm just thinking back at the technology, and, and it makes sense now because you've got the gyros, you've got the magnetometers. I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. Yep. Uh, the dilithium crystals, I'm just teasing you. Um, but the th thing is, like, we have back at the university, at UIT, we have a VR cave, and it, it's based on these Vicon cameras that, yep. that you know, I'm sure you know how the technology works, but in this case with Oculus, you're only handling with one camera. Is it, would you normally require two had it not been for the magnetometers and the gyros? Not, I mean, there's no way we could have made an optical only system. You don't want to make a system that, you want a system that fails gracefully. Uh, if you don't have gyros and accelerometers, you lose tracking, it's just gone. You're, you cannot do anything to try to make the image do anything. It's just, it, you, the image has to stop moving. So with, we can do, yes, we can get away with one camera because very rarely does tracking break with this system, only at the extreme limits of its tracking. And when it does break, it's not, it doesn't ruin the experience. It's just you lose a, the position tracking, but you're still able to look around and move to some degree based on our head model. Um, and our camera is really nice. We've developed all of the hardware to be very low latency and very high precision. We're doing sub-millimeter tracking. And... It's a, it's a pretty great system, even when compared to professional motion capture systems. Excellent, excellent. It, it's really, like, it, it is a very visually exciting experience, I, I, I have to say. Now, um, I noticed when we did the demo, and really when I play games at home, I'm sitting down all the time. Sure. But we're starting to see other, you know, solutions in the market, like, you know, that really count on us moving about. I mean, there's like there's the VR treadmills, like Virtuex Omni is an example. Um, you, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with Sixth Sense and, and uh, Prio VR is a work in progress. Uh, will, the, will Oculus continue to work very well with these technologies? I don't know, you'd need to ask them. I mean, we've been developing our system from the beginning, at least at, for now, to be a sitting down experience. Um, just the liability concerns, the technological issues, it's very hard to make a tracking system that works that, that works in a large space. And let's say you make it work when you're standing and turning around. Well, why shouldn't it work when you're actually walking? Um, why shouldn't you be able to move through large spaces? You have to pick some point that you optimize for. And right now, we think the vast majority of people are going to be using this seated. And we're not going to do anything purposefully to try and break it for people who don't want to do that, because there will be people doing that. But we aren't going to optimize our technology around something that is already limited by other parts of the headset. I mean, like for an example, if you want to stand and turn around multiple times and have full 360 tracking the whole time, and you can't do that. You only lose position for you know, a brief part of the rotation. Um, but if you do want to do that, we have a cable, and we're not getting rid of the cable anytime soon. I'd say that the, the cable that's wrapping around you is going to be a bigger issue than losing position tracking for you know, some part of the rotation when you're spinning around. You know what? It didn't even click with me that when I was doing that demo, I didn't even think to look for a cable coming out of the rift. Is it a wired solution, wireless solution? It is all wired. Okay, 
It is all wired. Okay. Now, uh, another big aspect that I, you know, I've seen from Oculus is there's a big push for for mobile support. Is that that true? That is correct. Okay. So, what kind of uh, mobile experiences would you like to see coming out of the Oculus Rift in mobile versus the PC world? Mobile mobile processes are fairly limited right now, but they're getting powerful very quickly. Mobile is more of a long term thing for us. We're really excited about at some point in the future being able to integrate a mobile system on a chip into the headset to be able to do basic gaming, word processing, internet browsing, uh, movie watching without the need to tether to a computer. So that would allow for full wireless use for a lot of these things. Um, in the meanwhile, we have we, we have a few other things like we can plug a headset into in, into a mobile phone or a tablet and run like we have VR cinema running at 60 frames a second and 3D at full res and that's really exciting. But as far as complex games, you're going to get a much better experience on a PC than you will with mobile right now. Is, uh, is it true that uh, John Carmack, that he's heading up the mobile effort? I mean, it, you know, you read stuff, but I, just the confirmation, is, it, is this his territory? This is, that's one of the things he's been working really deeply on. But it's not, it's not just him. We have a, a lot of people that have all been working on it. And when, when we started working on the mobile SDK and kind of talked about it publicly, there was this weird thing where people assumed that we were changing. They said, oh, Oculus is changing focus to Android. And we actually we announced Android support during our Kickstarter. So um, it was just us taking a year to get around to actually giving people what we promised. So, Is there something about, because obviously the processing power isn't quite there yet. I mean, obviously there's continual announcements of, of better technology every year, every six months. Um, but is there something exciting about mobile that, that Oculus said, you know what, we, we really need to do this? We need to continue working towards the point when we'll be able to integrate that technology into our headset. And it's not something we want to start years from now when we finally do it. We need to get started and start learning the intricacies, intricacies of that. And in the meanwhile, mobile is going to be a really powerful thing. I mean, there's a lot of headsets that are... There's a lot of headsets that are trying to leverage all of the hardware of a mobile phone, you know, trying to use the integrated motion sensors, just basically using the whole thing plus some plastic and lenses. And we think that there's potential for much better mobile experiences when you have a display that's optimized for virtual reality, when you have a sensor system that's optimized for virtual reality. And even though you do, you know, you want to have those benefits, but at the same time, mobile does allow you to do things you just can't do with a PC. You can't go on an airplane. Well, reasonably, you cannot go on an airplane with a powerful PC and, you know, be watching movies. It's a lot nicer to be able to, you know, have something, plug it into your phone, and it just works. Now, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, the business side of Oculus. And um, I'm, I'm not so much interested in the, in the decimal point numbers, sure. um, but... You know, what intrigues me about the Oculus story is, is, you know, when we first knew each other, I mean, you were just thrilled to have that successful Kickstarter, a goal of 250K going to two, almost two and a half million. Then there was a 16 million. Then recently there was a 74 million. But, you know, you're still dealing with prototypes that are products that haven't even been released yet. But, you know, people seem to get the idea. You know, they have this vision of where things can ultimately lead and, and, and they've from what I can tell, they've pretty much bought into it, which which is good to see. I'd be interested to hear from you what the elevator pitch is that you say to an investor and it says, you know what, let's write him a check. We don't, There, there is no elevator pitch with these types of things. Um, most of the investors know about us from existing, you know, media coverage and press. And it's a very... It, Talking with investors is a very long discussion, you know, um, starting with usually they have some knowledge of what it is. If they don't know what it is, they're pro I mean, we're going to investors that are some of the best people in the tech industry. If they don't know what we are, but like, you know, by the time that we were raising our Series B, they're probably not someone we should be talking to anyways. Um, and it's a very long process of going through, explaining what we're doing, showing what our long term vision is and them making sure that we can actually deliver on that vision. Now, for Oculus, I mean, you, you, I mean, the head-mounted display, is that just one facet of the business? I mean, do you, you know, when, when I think of uh, an investor putting in, I mean, let's say a combination of investors pushing close to 100 million, and, and you know, between the 74 and 16 and, you know, all the other stuff, they're going to expect, you know, multitudes back. Um, what, like, do you have a vision of where things are going to go? Like, are you, are you thinking software or like new games? Like, are, like, where do you want the company to be that is going to be this powerhouse to, to, you know, to raise that money? 
we are largely a software company. We have just as many people working on software as we do on hardware. Around the SDK side, sensor fusion, integration into game engines, developer relations, it just takes a lot of people with software expertise to make something like this. So even though we, we, we do have some of the best VR hardware out there right now, but our software is what makes it uh, what makes it really valuable. Our software stack is probably the best in the VR industry, and it's the first time that it's been possible for homebrew game developers to easily take create something in a game engine they're familiar with and then use it in VR and have a good experience. It's never been possible to do that so easily. And one of the things we did announce after our recent Series B was that we are doing publishing now. So we're working with a range of developers from indie all the way to AAA on publishing virtual reality games that are exclusive to VR and optimized specifically for the Rift. Um, I, you know, virtual reality is, I think, going to end up being a huge business. So even if, if we can capture even a significant chunk of that market as it takes off, I think that everyone will be really happy. Excellent. Now, you, you mentioned that, uh, you know, optimized for, for the Oculus Rift. We're, we're seeing other solutions in the market, and, you know, the industry really is a, at a formative stage. You're continually inventing. You know, I'm super impressed what I saw in the next room, but I also know I'm going to be super, super impressed with what you're eventually going to release after that, and who knows, you have a few more jumps to go. Meanwhile, there are other solutions in the market. Do you, do you have a vision where you know, Oculus could indeed be creating and distributing software for solutions above and beyond its own hardware? That's not the plan right now because there's, the hardware we've shown is not, the, that's not everything we have in development. We have a lot of things that we can't show that are pretty spectacular and it would be very hard for us to, you know, invest money in content and invest money in publishing games that, that don't, the best way to put it is we're, we want people that are making the best possible VR games. We think we have the best possible VR hardware. If someone else starts making VR hardware that's as good as ours, then we would consider it. You know, we, we are in a very powerful software position, but right now we're very focused on making games that take advantage of all of the features that we're going to be putting in our own hardware and taking advantage of all the features we're putting in our own software. Excellent, excellent. Now. You know, when I think of the game development industry or the game publishing industry, I mean, there are some big names like Electronic Arts and Activision, and of course, you've got the console makers, and there are some big, big players. But, you know, they, when they make money from doing what they know, and, and you know, like, you know, I'm not going to name names, but they one franchise after the other, product after product. Do you think this VR world is, is going to be primarily owned by the independent game developers? Do you think that the AAA game developers are, are going to you know, directly participate with this? Because what I saw in the other room was you know, extremely impressive, but it's also unlike the other games that are, exist on the store shelf. You, it's, it's, and, and I hope I'm using the right terminology here. It's like a, a love me or leave me technology. You, if you love it, you're going to get wonderful results. Um, but if you're not willing to make that commitment, you know, really, why, why should you get in the space? So, in this case, do you see the industry ready and willing to take that love at leap? Or do you think that, or is there an opportunity here for the independent developers to really build up that specialized market? Where, where do you see things going? I don't think the answer goes either way in particular. Um, it's not a matter of thinking, of wondering if the AAAs are ready. We know that some of them very much are. And same goes for indies. The indies are the ones that have announced a lot of stuff and done a lot of the innovative experiences right now. And there's a lot of indies who haven't announced stuff. But there's, I mean, we're working with hundreds of developers along that entire spectrum. So it's, I, I don't think that it's going to be indies owning the VR market. And I don't think that it's going to be AAA owning the VR market. And I don't think it's going to be only indies or only AAAs. It's going to be a healthy mix of both. Um, we Winning best hardware of E3 and then now best of CES. It's one of those things where a AAA publisher, even to the bean counters who don't maybe necessarily know about VR or care about VR, they look at it and say, oh, well, that's probably a platform that's going to be successful if it's getting that much attention, that much good press, and is actually getting more awards than some of the things that we're currently spending a lot of money developing games for. Okay, excellent, excellent. Now, as an early stage, I mean, I you know, I, I think of the game development industry and, you know, as I described earlier, and maybe it's not a fair judgment, but 
you know, I don't know how much has really changed. I mean, the story, I think, may be the biggest enhancement to game development. I mean, we've obviously been able to show more pixels and more physics effects, but if you date back to, like, Doom 3, I mean, the, that formula has worked consistently for, you know, decades. So do you think that the gaming industry is just, you know, they just want to try something new and this this could be it? I think they've always wanted to try something new, and I actually think that most of at least a lot of the game industry has always wanted virtual reality. Uh, John Carmack has always been interested in virtual reality and the people who spend the most time crafting all of these beautiful virtual worlds are probably among the people who most want to step inside them. So it's something that people have wanted for a long time. It, it's not getting traction because it's new and interesting. It's getting traction because it's something people have always wanted. It's an old idea that's never been possible. And, and you know, I, and I, I, I would underscore that too. I mean, like I, you know, we've been we've known each other for years, and like during the 3D, it was, you know, I, I would say that it was it was shot before it had its chance. People didn't either they didn't understand the vision, or they didn't like the glasses, or you know, for whatever reason, it just it didn't really take off the way people anticipated. But through VR, people just get it. Like they they think of that holodeck, and they think, you know, what can I do to make that holodeck work? And, and it's not even about having the hardware, it's the invention process, which I think people are excited about. Would, would you agree with that? Yes. I think 3D displays, I mean, I, I bought a lot of 3D displays. I am a 3D enthusiast. But on in general, I think 3D was more of a manufacturer and content creator driven innovation, not a consumer driven innovation. I don't think that people were, you know, saying, oh, I really want to have 3D, and then the market responded. They were saying, we need a new way to make our movies attractive and stick out. And the manufacturer said, we need a new feature that we can, that we can you know, say we have and the other people don't. And another reason for people to buy a new flashy TV, because you know, TV, TV, TVs have been 1080p for a long time. They needed something new to get people excited. And I don't think that consumers were nearly as excited about it as the manufacturers, the content creators. With VR, people have wanted it for a very long time, and nobody's been able to deliver it. Uh, and I think that that shows in our Kickstarter. The Kickstarter wasn't, wasn't a manufacturer or a content creator saying, hey, guys, this is going to be the new thing. And people said, eh, it looks OK. Maybe if it ends up built into every TV anyways, I'll use it. They got a bunch of people who said, this is something I've wanted for a long time, or just a short time, and I'm willing to back it right now, even when it's just in such an early stage, when it's not a fully developed product. Um, and I think the, react the reactions we continue to get shows that people, consumers really do want VR, um, and developers want to make content for VR, and manufacturers want to make hardware for VR. So it's everyone aligning into the same goal to make great virtual reality experiences. Okay, so just a couple remaining questions, very simple ones. Uh, okay, yeah. So, uh, any word on when we'll see another developer's kit and consumer version of the product, or are we no still word. in the invention process? No word right now. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much for thank joining you. us, Palmer, and uh, we'll see more of you. Thank you for watching. This is Neil Schneider with Palmer Lucky, MTBS TV at CES 2014. Thank you for watching.